Only two days later, Jesus changed all that when God raised him from the dead. But the significance of Easter only comes fully to us as we come Friday night and we see the depth of sin that Jesus died for. Uh, we come to remember that tonight, confess our sins, so let's begin by prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come tonight to remember what you did in sending your son, what a sacrifice it was to give up your son, what a sacrifice it was for Jesus to never have sinned, yet to die as a common criminal and to take all the sins of the world on him. Our sins too, our sins today were put on Christ. And so we thank you for that great sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. Because of that, we have a chance to have victory over sin and new life in us and victory over evil. Uh, we see so much evil in the world still, Lord. Uh, you have not vanquished sa Satan, and uh, we still sin, and, and, and people apart from you uh, make terrible mistakes, and so we see a lot in this world. But we thank you for the hope that we know the resurrection has happened and there is victory ahead when you come again. Uh, so tonight, as we think of what our sins did in putting you on the cross, may we worship you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Well, my name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church, and I have the honor to speak with you tonight about uh, the totality of Christ's death. And we're going to really look into what it is that Jesus accomplished on the cross two th almost 2,000 years ago on the cross on Good Friday. And we call it good not because um, crucifixion was a good thing. It was obviously a horrific thing, but because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, that is a very good thing. And so we celebrate it, but we also, this is a day to reflect, to think about our sin, and as Ron mentioned earlier, to ponder on it and to come here and to confess and to come before God and just say, God, this is where I have sin in my life. And so we are here tonight to reflect on this amazing sacrifice that Jesus paid on our behalf. And Ron preached on this on Sunday, but crucifixion was purposefully brutal and violent. It was something that was used by the Romans in order to control the people so that there wouldn't be some sort of insurrection or rebellion. And so when we look at the cross, it's supposed to be ugly. It's supposed to be uh, brutal and violent and almost repulsive to a certain extent until Jesus it's amazing to me when I think about what the cross has accomplished, that it took something so shameful to that culture, something that when they, they wouldn't even talk about it, wouldn't even speak about it, and now it's something that for thousands of years, millions of people have looked to as the ultimate symbol for hope. That's what Jesus has done, and that is what the totality of what Christ did on the cross how, that's what happened. And so when we look tonight, I want you to focus on that word, totality. I'm going to repeat it over and over again because it is what happened. And what Jesus accomplished was totally finished, done, complete. There's no exceptions, no ifs, ands, or buts, no, no getting around it. It is a total thing. And so tonight we're going to look at four outcomes that result from the death of Christ, what Jesus has accomplished. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. We're going to be looking through verses 33 through 39. And while you're turning there, we'll just rehash the story that should, that if you've been, if you've grown up in church, you've been part of church for a while, should be very familiar. That Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples, Judas, and then he is put through a trial all through the night, an unfair trial. He is then condemned as a criminal. He is going to be crucified on the cross, and he gets crucified at nine o'clock in the morning. And at nine o'clock, he is being, and before he's being crucified, he's being mocked, he's being spit on, he is, a crown of thorns is being put upon him, kind of ridiculing him for his claim of being the king of the Jews, for being the Messiah. And when we come to our passage in Mark 15, Jesus is on the cross and he's been there for a few hours. So let's go ahead and read verses 33 to 37. Let's look at it. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. 
And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those, some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And immediately we're, we're encountering something that's supernatural. At noon, this kind of crazy darkness shows up that covers the whole land for three hours. I mean, it gets kind of dark and dreary around here in the wintertime, but we're not talking that kind of darkness in the middle of the day. And oftentimes, when we look through the Bible and we see what darkness uh, portrays, darkness is more about God's like justice and God's wrath being poured out. You think about it from one of the plagues of the Egyptians, one of the ten plagues in the book of Exodus. It's the ninth plague, and it covers the whole land, and it's so dark in the land of Egypt that they, it's a darkness they said they can feel. And this is a sign of God's divine displeasure in that area. And so what's happening? What, we have to understand this. What's happening at this moment is Jesus is on the cross. He has offered himself up as the ultimate sacrifice. And as a result, he is, he is having sin poured out upon him. All of our sins. Every single person that has ever existed on this planet, you and I, that is in all of us that are in this room, past, present, future, all sin for all time, for all people are being laid upon him all at once to be the ultimate sacrifice. And because God is a perfect and holy God, there is something he has to do about sin. It's, and we call it justice. That God, that there's a price that has to be paid. So God is pouring out his wrath, his justice upon Jesus, upon his son, because his son offered himself to do it. So that we would not have to be the ones to take that punishment. And what's amazing when we look at this is we, we see Hebrews 12 too, what it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I don't think there would have been anybody in any, at any point in history that would have said that they enjoyed the cross. They would have enjoyed being crucified. But Jesus, knowing what's going to result, gives himself willingly for this because of how he is going to reconcile all people back to himself, back to the way things were intended to be in that perfect relationship with, between creation and God, between his created people and God. And what's amazing is, is Jesus doesn't last very long on the cross. He lasts maybe six hours. Six hours. And part of this is because of what he is experiencing. He's experiencing that separation. You know, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That whole thing he's experiencing, he is for the fir very first time, because he has become sin on our behalf, he now is separated from his father. He says multiple times in the gospels that he and the father are one. And so he is now it's experiencing the kind of separation that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And so he feels the weight of it and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why are you cursing me? This is one of the most raw moments, human moments of Jesus's life. And when he cries that out, he's actually crying out in his native Aramaic. So he's just kind of bursting with emotion at this moment. Why have you forsaken me? But when he says this, they think he's calling out to Elijah. And so they're, they're curious, the people that are surrounding him. And so they give him this wine vinegar. And what that wine vinegar is, is just a replenishing drink to try and actually to keep them alive. They wanted to see what was going to happen. But Jesus, as you can see here, it says that with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And we don't know from Mark what loud cry this is. You know, there's a couple different options. There's the idea of when he says, it is finished, or into your hands I commit my spirit. No matter how you look at it, Jesus willingly gave up himself, willingly surrenders his life. And even this Roman centurion, as we'll see later, the Roman centurion sees this and goes, wait a minute, that's different. That's a different death. He says, surely this was the son of God. Because usually people on the cross would, would take about two to three days to die. 
Can you imagine that? The ultimate pain on that cross, being there for two to three days? The whole point was to try and drag this out, to suffer. It was an excruciating thing. It was for suffering. It was to make a point that if you try anything against us, the Romans would do, that's, that's your punishment. That's what you're going to get. But Jesus, because he's bearing the weight, because he is holding that emotional weight, and also because he um, just gives of himself. He gives of himself. And so he's, he is now surrendering his life. And we know that what he did, by doing that, by giving of his life, that he has given a total and ultimate sacrifice. So our first total thing that Jesus did is that his death accomplished the total payment for mankind's sin. We're going to look at Hebrews 9, 25 to 26. It'll be on the screen, so you don't need to turn there. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. What this is talking about, it's talking about the difference between the Old Testament sacrificial system and Jesus. The Old Testament sacrificial system, the old, like the high priest, would have to go through this, these rituals in order to make himself clean so he could be the representative to God for the people. And he had to do this every single year and use an animal sacrifice in order to make that happen. But Jesus gave up of himself so that this sacrifice would be enough for once and for all. The payment is paid. It's done. That is the amazing thing, that there is no other need for a payment for sin because Jesus did it. Jesus paid it. He paid that price, and it is an absolute total price. And the payment was with his own blood. It says just a few verses before uh, this Hebrews 9 passage, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And in the Old Testament, blood was about life, was signified life. And so Jesus giving his own life, his perfect spotless life for us was enough to cover over every single sin, past, present, future, paid in full. Amazing, right? Our second outcome is that his death extends total forgiveness for our sin. And there's a difference between payment and forgiveness. The payment is the cost. The cost was his life. The cost was his blood. But what resulted from that is forgiveness. Total, complete forgiveness. Look at Colossians 2, 13 through 14. When you were dead in your sins and, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us, does that say some of our sin? Does it say like the little itty bitty ones? No. Forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Every single one of our sins, if you put your faith in Christ, has been nailed to that cross, died with him, and was buried with him. It is totally forgiven forever. You can't think of a single sin that Jesus did not pay for. You can't think of any sin that you say, no, that's too much. That's too far. That goes way beyond the power of what Jesus could possibly forgive. No, that passage is very clear. Forgave us all our sins. Because if you can think of something that Jesus didn't pay for, then he's not God. Then he's not the ultimate sacrifice. That's the beauty of what this sacrifice is, is that he was, the, that he was able to forgive all of them. All. So in those moments when you feel guilt and shame for things that you have done, take a moment, stop, pause, and go, I'm forgiven. It's clear. My debt has been paid. It has been canceled. I have nothing before God that he will condemn me with because of what Christ did. There's nothing one of my favorite verses in all the Bibles, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are a follower of Christ, nothing can condemn you. 
You can make mistakes. You can still sin. You can still screw things up. But you know what? Before God, no condemnation. Nothing. It's beautiful. It's an amazing thing that he did. And the third thing is that his death enables total redemption from our sin and brokenness. It goes beyond just payment and forgiveness. Look at this. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is more than just the cancellation of your sin, but it's also what that word redemption means is release, to be set free, to be ransomed. The whole point of the Christian faith is not just so that you can be forgiven and have a, an eternal get out of jail free card that you can pull out whenever you need it. Oops, God, let's, let's throw that out there. That's not how this, this works. Is that God is wanting to set you free from your sin. Set you free so that you can live the way that he has created you to live. You weren't meant to live and be stuck within your sin. You were meant to live a redeemed life that can be lived in full fullness of, of, of holiness before God. In a, in a relationship with God that, was, that you were meant to have with him and then living out the way that he has created you to live. That's what that's for. That's what redemption is all about. That you can be forgiven and then you can be set free to live the life that God has given you. It's an amazing thing. His death and his subsequent resurrection defeated sin and death so that his resurrection life could be given to each one of us. And so that we could be free to live in the kingdom of God where freedom from sin and death is the plan. It's the plan to be freed from these things. Let's look at Mark 15 back again. Mark 15, 38 through 39. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this was the son of God. And this curtain, you have to understand this curtain, this wasn't like a little tiny window shade. We're talking this massive curtain. We're talking up to about 80 feet high. 80 feet high, this massive curtain that separated between the temple and the most holy place, God's actual presence in Israel, in the temple. And it's torn from top to bottom. That signifies that God has opened the way, that God has paved the way for there to be access to him. And that's the fourth outcome. That is the fourth outcome of Jesus' death on the cross is that it has enabled total access to God. Total access. I want you to look at Romans 5. It's up on the screen. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, since we've been saved through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. The amazing thing now is before, before Jesus' death, they would have to go through these rituals just to be able to talk to God. But what they now have is is. God has paved the way so that we can have access to God. If you give your life to Christ, any moment you can come and speak to him and say, God, I'm in need of something. You can talk to him at any point. There is full access. And the beauty of what this passage says is now there is peace with God. We have to understand that in Ephesians 2, it says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were objects of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ. That by Jesus dying on the cross, he has paved the way so that we would no longer be at war with God. We would no longer be separated from God, but that we could have access and have peace with him. And the amazing thing is, is that when we have this kind of access, Jesus' payment on our behalf satisfies that the justice. Satisfies the justice required on behalf of sin. And so instead of us being known as objects of God's wrath, dead in our sin, we are now at peace with God. And our lives are now marked by grace and by mercy and by favor. That is mind-boggling. Because I know my life. I don't know about you. I know my life. I know where I've been and I know what I've done. I don't deserve it. At all. And I, because I know the human condition, I'm guessing you don't either. 
I'm fairly confident you don't either. (laughs) We are all in that. And so tonight, I want us to to count the cost of what the cross is. Yes, this is an amazing thing that has happened to us that now we have the, the total, uh, we have the total payment taken care of. We have total forgiveness. We have total redemption. We have total access to God. We have all these amazing things, but there was a huge cost. And the cost was that our sin was what put him there. My sin, your sin, it put him there. It's what made the cross necessary. And crucifixion in many ways is kind of a strong picture of the, the disgusting nature of what sin is. When you look at the cross and see someone being um, brutally murdered in that way, that we see sin in its full embodiment of what it is. Sin is ugly. Sin is disgusting before God, but God took it upon himself. God took it upon himself because he wanted to reconcile all of us. So count that cost. Think about your sin. Recognize that there is sin and and say to God, God, I have sin in my life. I have done things that I regret. I have thought things that I regret. I have felt things that I know is sin before you. And I have not done things that I know I was supposed to do that were good. God, but you paid the price. You went to the cross on my behalf. But also remember, also remember that if you give your life to Christ, all of that is totally taken care of. You are at peace with God. And so if you're, if you're a Christian here tonight, this is something that is encouraging. This is something that is beautiful. It is something that is, uh, that should engender joy within us. It's somber reality, yes, that we recognize you know, it's, I put him there. But also a joyful thing to recognize, thank you, God, for what you did. But at the same time, there's a, if you are not a Christian in this room, you have to recognize what the Bible says. The Bible says you are still dead in your sin. You are still an object of wrath, but this is being offered to you. All of what I talked about tonight is being laid out before you saying, take it. All you have to do is to say, Jesus, I give my life to you. Jesus, I believe. I surrender my life to you. That free offer of grace is right there in front of you. And if you do, if you take that up, you can sing along with the hymn, one of my favorite hymns. It's called Before the Throne of God Above. Listen to these lines in this this one part of the stanza. Because the sinless Savior died, My sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. And so that's what we celebrate tonight. The fact that Jesus died, that he put himself on the cross. The sinless Savior died and our sinful souls are counted free. It is a beautiful thing. Let's pray. God, thank you for what you did all those years ago for dying on the cross on our behalf. God, this is a a gift that we don't deserve, none of us. And God, we look at the cross and we see that it was our sin that held you there. It was our sin that put you there. And so Jesus, we ask, we ask for the grace to continue in our lives so that we can be set free as your word as your word promises to us, that we are set free. So let us live as if we are in freedom. And God, I do pray for anyone in here tonight that came in, doesn't know you, God, that this amazing story of your, your sacrifice on the cross would be compelling enough that they would want to give their lives to you. And God, the beauty of this story is that it didn't finish on Good Friday. That's, that Friday happened, but Sunday is coming. That is the only way any of this is effective is because of the fact that you rose again. And so Jesus, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. And as we continue to worship God, we just give ourselves to you. We praise your name. Amen.